It basically targeted any information that was being put out about Biden's mental decline as disinformation. A judge just ruled that Google is maintaining an illegal monopoly. I'm Stephanie Keith. And I am Tara Manjekovic. And we are Unapologetically Outspoken. Hey everyone, happy Friday. So I want to follow up from our last episode because we talked about Kamala's new running mate, Tim Waltz, and how he, you know, left the military uh, right when he was scheduled to go to Iraq. And I saw on Megyn Kelly, she had someone from his platoon that was talking about how the guy is completely lying about his title as commander. Um, but then also the Daily Mail posted an article. They talked to um, a mother of soldier Kyle Miller. He was killed by a roadside bomb in Iraq when he was only 19 years old. And um, Tim Waltz was supposed to be his leader. And so um, his mother gave a very emotional interview to Daily Mail. And I'm just going to read that. She said, I don't think it's fair that Waltz takes credit when he didn't step up to the plate. Waltz claims a rank he never earned. When he was called to serve and protect our country, he didn't. To publicly present false prestige of his unearned rank and inaccurate representation is a falsehood of who he truly is. My son stepped up to the plate. All our sons stepped up. My son wasn't even 21 years old. He couldn't even buy alcohol, yet he took the step to serve our country while Waltz found the best way to run away. It was a coward's way out. It makes you wonder if he will bow out in some manner and not accomplish the job he's supposed to get done. So, like, that's so sad that, you know, this parent now who lost her son over there is now seeing this guy, you know, trying to portray himself as this, like, war hero when he clearly wasn't. So I just wanted to read that just to give a little more backstory on the character of this guy. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. So <laughs> today we have a ton of very interesting lawsuits going on that really give me a lot of hope as to where things are going. So we're going to start with the Biden family. And it makes me wonder if the Biden family shady business dealings are finally, finally catching up with them. All right. So even ABC News is reporting on this. So this is like out there. It's not going away. They published an article stating, quote, prosecutors and special counsel David Weiss's office are accusing Hunter Biden of accepting payments from a Romanian businessman who was attempting to influence U.S. government agencies while his father, Joe Biden, was vice president. At Hunter Biden's upcoming tax trial, the government will introduce the evidence that Hunter Biden and business associate one received compensation from a foreign principal who was attempting to influence U.S. policy and public opinion and caused the United States to investigate the Romanian investigation of Popovici. I have no idea how to say that in Romania. Um, the article goes on to say that, um, or sorry, that was, I guess that was the end of my quote. Um, so this Romanian guy, I'm just going to call him the Romanian guy since I can't pronounce his name, <laughs> but this guy that Hunter Biden was doing business with, he was facing corruption charges in his country at the time of doing these business dealings with Hunter Biden. So really not a good look for the president's son and I guess vice president at the time. And so prosecutors say that Hunter and two business associates split $3 million in payments from this Romanian businessman. And so I was reading this and my conspiracy brain just starts going wild because then I start thinking, OK, the powers that be, did they get word that this was coming from the special counsel? And then that's why they went ahead and let Biden debate Trump, knowing he would make an ass out of himself. So then the Democrats would have like this legitimate looking reason to get rid of Biden before all of this information was made public. And of course, like that's just my conspiracy. But I don't know. What do you think, Tara? I think the timing was probably even more choreographed than that. Like 
We've been talking about evidence of Hunter's shady business dealings for the entire two years that we've been doing this podcast. It's been over a year since the House Oversight Committee presented pretty damning information and evidence. Um, remember, like the suspicious activity reports, the bank records, Hunter being an unregistered foreign agent, the whole Burisma scandal, right? I mean, it was a shit ton of evidence. But the only thing that happened was he got indicted back in December of last year on felony charges for failure to pay taxes. And then he gets convicted on this felony gun charges a few months ago for the you know ap firearm application. But basically, it's all been minor shit in the scheme of the actual big picture of long-term corruption involving Hunter and basically the entire Biden family up until now. So suddenly, the corrupt DOJ that has protected Biden and Hunter this entire time, they suddenly turn not just on Hunter, but on on the agency itself by admitting to their own corruption and trying to hide the truth. And then you have the media presenting it like, wow, it's this shocking story with sudden new evidence. And like, I don't buy that shit for a second. They knew all about this. There's a reason it's being made public now. And Stephanie, what makes the timing even more interesting and suspicious to me, it was only a few days ago that the sentencing for Hunter's gun charge case was announced. And it's not going to happen until November 13th. So it's going to be after the election. And remember when Hunter was initially convicted, Biden said he wasn't going to use presidential powers to pardon him or commute his sentence. But now Biden's not running for re-election anymore. So it's not going to hurt his campaign if he decides to do that. And, you know, this alleged, quote, new information is surfacing like the timing of that just seems a little too coincidental to me. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't doubt that this wasn't part of the deal they made with Biden. Like, OK, you drop right. out and then we'll get this done so you can go ahead and pardon your son before you leave office. You know, exactly. like the whole thing's shady. And it made me so mad when ABC News was reporting this because I'm like, you know, the right has been talking about this for years and we were called conspiracy theorists and, you know, there's no evidence. And now they're reporting on it. Like you said, like it's like it's new. No, we've known about this forever. And yeah, the whole thing is just so set up. It's it's absolutely ridiculous. But speaking of court cases, remember last week when I said that Google was censoring Trump searches and like instead of showing Trump, they were showing Kamala and they were trying to hide his whole assassination attempt. And they got caught with their pants down when Elon Musk posted all the screenshots of like what was yeah. coming up. Well, karma is a bitch because a judge just ruled that Google is maintaining an illegal monopoly. So obviously Google owns Android. So all Android phones are going to default to the Google search engine. But what got them in hot water was that they have these distribution agreements with Apple. And so the search engines on iPhones, they actually default to a Google-owned search engine, which I didn't realize that. I thought Safari was like totally separate. I guess it's all owned by Google and it just defaults to Google. And so this got them in trouble because that shows they're essentially paying to be a monopoly. And that's what's illegal about it. And so in 2020, 90% of all internet searches went through Google and 95% of mobile searches went through Google. Like, just imagine the power that this one company has when 90% of all internet information goes through them. And we know for a fact, they censor things. They've been caught. So it's like they can create any narrative they want. They, they literally control the information of our world. And it's kind of like how every time I go and search for articles, guess who's the first one to pop up? CNN. They're yep. always the first. But I will never find Newsmax, Daily Wire, Fox News, Just the News. Like if I want to see their articles, I have to actually go directly to their website. I cannot just like search. And so I was really happy to see this because, like I said, Google has been censoring the right for years. And they've been doing it very blatantly, in my opinion. They've been kicking out apps like Parler from their app store. And now I think Karma's biting them in the ass. So I'm excited. Okay. Speaking of censoring and social media, have you seen all the videos and the social media posts that are being released by a journalist? His name is Matt Orfalia. And he's showing all 
all of these leaked Zoom calls from the you know Biden Harris campaign back in 2020. And staffers are talking about how they manipulated disinformation back then to hide Biden's cognitive decline from voters. And I have not seen this. Like, this is crazy. Yeah, it is not mainstream, but all everything is there on X. And I read the initial uh, article in The Daily Caller. So this journalist or or Falia, he's laying out this guy named Rob Flaherty, who's like the he was the digital director for the Biden Harris campaign, and he's currently Kamala's deputy campaign manager. So I want to play this clip. It was a Zoom call on November 20th in 2020 that this guy Flaherty conducted with a group called Hope Not Hate. And I guess they're a UK based activist group who claims like their mission is to combat far right extremism. And they're explaining this whole disinformation thing. You know, one of the smartest things that I think the, the party did itself uh, was over the last uh, couple of years, they actually invested in a team uh, that Tim runs, and, and you'll hear from Tim, um, to detect and, and track uh, misinformation and misinformation um, narratives in the sort of various corners of the internet, uh, and then actually go out and, and flag it to platforms um, as, as a violation of their policy. Uh, and so um, that work, I mean, the, the, the stuff that, that they did was a critical asset. That piece of infrastructure, I think, was one of the more important decisions that um, was made in, in sort of the party space over the last um, couple of years. Um, OK, there's one more. So he's talking about the Biden admins campaign. We brought and to sort of think through, OK, now that we have these misinformation narratives, what do we actually do? Um, like, uh, uh, it is it is one thing to know that um, there is a lot of conversation online about corruption or or you know mental fitness or or any of these things, um, or or um, you know the vice president's record on the crime bill, um, which you know was sort of a controversial uh, piece of legislation in, in the early nineties. Um, but it was it was another to go. Okay, now, now what? Okay, so in that second clip, he references Becca, and he's referring to Rebecca Rinkovich, who was also on the call. And she was the director of rapid response for the Biden for President campaign. And then she later became the Biden admins White House deputy director of digital strategy. So then Becca gets on the call. She's explaining about how they basically targeted any information that was being put out about Biden's mental decline as dis information. And this was all using tactics designed around um, micro-targeting of voters. So I want to play another clip that this guy or or Falia posted on X because it shows um, an interview with this guy named Christopher Wiley. He was part of Cambridge Analytica and he became a whistleblower. And he He's talking about how psychographic targeting was used in the 2016 election. And in this clip, Rinkovich, she's pretty much using the exact same strategy in 2020. Essentially, the pitch was that we were going to combine micro-targeting, which had existed in politics, which was, you know, in part my background, but bring bring on board um, a new a new construct, new constructs from psychology so that we wouldn't just be targeting you as a voter. We'd be targeting you as a personality. Um, we targeted folks based on um, online behavioral cues, building out personas, targeting you as a personality, personas based on um, the type of content they were consuming, what they were searching, the kinds of websites they were visiting. We could build a psychological profile of each voter in a particular region. We built out different um, personas for the different um, parts of our key audiences, both persuadable and our um, supporters, um, and then targeted them with custom campaigns. So you've harvested my data and then you've used that to target me in ways that I can't see and that I don't understand. Yeah, so we would know we would know what kinds of messaging 
you would be susceptible to, including the framing of it, the topics, the contents, the tone, whether it's scary or not, that kind of thing. So what you would be susceptible to and, and where you're going to consume that. And then how many times do we need to touch you with that in order to change how you, how you think about something? So that is fucking insane, right? And so then she talks about how they basically targeted people based on these behavioral cues and this whole persona thing, and that the Biden team was able to successfully use social media to influence at least 200,000 votes for Biden based on data that they collected. Um, I guess NPR collected data from state officials, and it showed that, quote, risk and hit concern around Biden's mental acuity in particular went down by eight points over the course of our campaign, end quote. Like, Stephanie, this basically shows how much influence social media has when it comes to censorship and creating these false propaganda narratives. And again, I, as I mentioned earlier, this the same crew is like on Kamala's campaign team. You know, this is only going to be intensified. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think I was telling you this the other day. I saw um, the older millennial. He's like one of my favorite creators on TikTok. He was on Fox News and he was explaining how the Democrats are absolutely winning on social media because they're investing a ton of money in it. They're hiring influencers. So these people that are out there pushing Kamala, they're getting a full time paycheck from it. Republicans aren't doing that. Republicans are trying to ban TikTok where Democrats are getting in the game and they are investing a lot of money and they're really good at it. And just to give you an example, like I posted a video that went viral and I had to I I had to like just shut off TikTok last night because it was really messing with me because there were all these comments from people and they have this whole narrative and every single comment sounds the same. So it tells me they're either bots or they're influencers, moderators, whatever you want to call them that are being paid by the campaign to give a certain talking point, which is that, oh, the whole reason why the economy was so great under Trump is because he actually inherited that from Obama. Obama set it up and then Trump inherited it. And the reason the economy is bad now is because that's from Trump. And like people are believing this shit. They're yes. very convincing. They're very good. And this just goes to show like it goes deep. I mean, they are looking at personality types. They're using like psychological weapons basically to completely change yeah. the narrative. And just think about it. It's like, okay, so this um, particular thing you're talking about talks about Biden's cognitive decline all the way in 2020. They called us crazy for it. They misinformation labels. And now we know he did have cognitive decline. Hunter Biden's laptop, that was misinformation. Now we know it's absolutely real. Um, the COVID, did that come from a lab? Now we know. Yeah, it most likely did. Um, and we could go on and on and on and on. But like, when are people going to wake up and realize that all of this misinformation is really the true misinformation? Like, it's all flip-flop. The conspiracies are truth. The mis the misinformation tags are are censoring the truth. It's just insane. Um, and it, I feel like that's why I'm so excited about today's episode, because I feel like finally some truth is coming out and some justice is being served. Is it enough? No, but I think it's a step in the right direction. So I have like the craziest story now. This is a billion dollar lawsuit against CNN. So, OK, remember when Biden backed out of Afghanistan and it was like disastrous? We lost oh, yeah. 13 soldiers. We left. How could we forget? <laughs> right. So and we I mean, we covered this like we left hundreds of people behind for dead because these were people that helped our military. And, you know, we promised them safety and then we just abandoned them. So I remember we reported on this, like at the time we were saying how um, the Biden administration was basically like, well, we're just going to leave it up to private groups to evacuate them instead of our government evacuating them. Well, one of the people that stepped up to the plate to save these people from being like brutally murdered, uh, specifically women and children he saved from Taliban control, was Zachary Young. Now, he had no funds from the government or any like charity fundraisers to help pay for this. And as you can imagine, chartering private planes to go into enemy territory 
isn't cheap. So he charged the people that he was evacuating. And CNN went wild with this. I mean, it was all they talked about. They were saying that he was um, extorting people and that this was illegal. And they basically painted him out to be this like illegal human trafficker. When in reality, he was stepping up to save the people that our government left behind. So fast forward, and now he's suing CNN for defamation. Well, the problem with most defamation suits and why they don't go very far is because the standards are incredibly high. Like you have to prove that there was actual intentional malice. So what ended up happening was leaked messages came out from CNN. And so um, the primary reporter, Alex Markhart, sent a message to his colleague saying he wanted to, quote, nail this Zachary Young motherfucker, end quote. And he made comments about how um, this was going to be Young's funeral. And then even a CNN editor, Matthew Phillips, chimed in and said, quote, I'm going to hold you to that, cowboy. So clearly, like, they had malice. They wanted to nail this guy. They wanted it to be his funeral, you know. And um, they continued to call Young's rescue mission a scam, despite any evidence whatsoever of it being a scam. So now, today, they are being sued for over a billion dollars for defamation. And since they have all of these messages from CNN, they will likely win. And you'll never guess, Tara, you will never freaking guess what CNN told the court as their defense. Okay, brace yourself. They said, well, it wasn't that Zachary Young violated any actual laws, but he was violating Sharia law. Okay, Sharia law is Islamic religious law. And CNN in court, they're stating that they had the right to call Young's operation illegal because it fucking violated Islamic religious Sharia law. Like, you can't make this shit up. Since when do we in America go off of Sharia law? I don't even know if I'm saying that word right, but I know, you know what I mean? Like, we hear about it all the time in the Middle East. That's their their defense. And it's like, well, no shit. It violated the Taliban's religious law. That's the whole point. He was trying to rescue these victims because under Sharia law, they were going to be raped, tortured, and murdered. I mean, it's so crazy. It's like I couldn't even believe it. But Fox News, among other um, outlets, have articles on it if anyone wants to go and like do a deep dive. But man, like I really am rooting for Young. I hope he wins this lawsuit and I hope CNN is held responsible and does have to pay a billion dollars because that's absolutely ridiculous that now in America, we're going to hold people to the standards of Islamic religious law. It's insane. That's so far reaching. Like that's that's like frivolous lawsuit thrown out of court kind of idiocy. Yeah, yeah. It'll be telling, too. I don't know anything about the judge. I mean, if it's a judge in New York, like, who knows? But it's, like, yeah, so yeah. unbelievable. But that just goes to show they don't have a case. Like, if they're if they're reaching for that, like, it's over. But the lawsuits don't stop there. I mean, I am telling you, this is the week of lawsuits. So Elon Musk's ex and Rumble, and then I think also Daily Wire now, um, they filed lawsuits in federal court with the World Federation of Advertisers, citing that the WFA violated antitrust laws by organizing boycotts against tech companies that wouldn't change their policies around, guess what, misinformation and censorship. So according to Wired.com, the suit says dozens of advertisers followed the recommendation of a key advertising coalition called the Global Alliance for Responsible Media, or GARM, to boycott buying ads on X ever since Elon Musk bought the company. And the suit says that this turn of events cost the company billions of dollars in revenue. So GARM basically sounds like the advertising mob, like companies hire GARM to go and find advertising spots for their company across platforms. But here's the thing. GARM only has six members, which are these six like major big advertising companies that basically control the ad market. And GARM membership requires members to not advertise on any platforms that don't comply with their policies on misinformation. So, of course, X and Rumble 
are more conservative, and that goes against their policies on misinformation. So according to this Wired article, the U.S. House Judiciary Committee, which is controlled by Republicans, um, they've expressed concern about the censorship of right-wing views on social media and have been investigating GARM. And there was actually uh, a hearing where Ben Shapiro uh, from the Daily Wire went and talked to Congress and had some great evidence. Um, but in a preliminary report in July, the committee found that, quote, the extent to which GARM has organized its trade association and coordinates actions that rob consumers of choices is likely illegal under the antitrust laws and threatens fundamental American freedoms, end quote. So X's lawsuit draws heavily from internal GARM emails that were reviewed by the congressional panel. Um, and the emails pretty much state that like this misinformation is basically a guise for them boycotting conservative viewpoints and conservative businesses. Um, so that kind of explains the background of like all of this censorship and all these misinformation policies on social media, um, which ended up causing the true misinformation to be spread while the truth was hidden during COVID, which, you know, now, like I just, like I said earlier, it's all coming out. So Tara, get this after these lawsuits were filed, like immediately after this all happened in like two days, GARM shut down. They just completely shut down. And this is huge. I think it's very telling that clearly they know they're fucked. They're in the wrong. There's proof of it. There's emails and they can't win. So they shuttered their business. And the whole thing made me so curious about social media in general and really about Mark Zuckerberg because he's over Facebook and Instagram. And he, those platforms have completely censored the right. There's been so many issues with them to the point where we quit posting on there. Um, and now I wonder, was he bullied into censoring the right during COVID by the advertising mob? Because think about it. The threat of losing billions of dollars is a big deal, especially when you're a publicly traded company that has to answer to a board of directors. You can't just allow billions of dollars in revenue to stop, you know? And so I I don't know. I'm, I'm curious. And according to Trump, Mark Zuckerberg has personally called him three times since the assassination attempt and allegedly apologized on one of the phone calls. Um, and then Zuckerberg also publicly stated that he's staying out of politics now. So I feel like we're at a point in time, and I think I said this before, but if Mark Zuckerberg is waking up to the bullshit, there's hope. There is hope for all to wake up to the bullshit. And I just think the fact that GARM has shut down is such a big step for our First Amendment freedom of speech. Yeah, I guess like... Jim Jordan, like there's a whole like committee investigation going on into the World Advertising Federation. And it it goes beyond just like these companies. It's like major companies um, like Mars and Unilever and Disney, Coca-Cola, like all these big companies. And I guess Jim Jordan was interviewed and he basically said that like this investigation is going to be ongoing and they're looking at bias with all of these companies. And so I really do. I fucking hope that something comes of this. And since yeah. we're on the topic of lawsuits, I'm just going to throw one more in here because I was reading this in the Associated Press. Yesterday, 15 states filed a lawsuit against the Biden admin over a rule that will allow around 100,000 migrants who came to the U.S. illegally as children, like in that Dreamers program. It's allowing them to enroll in the Affordable Care Act for health insurance. And according to the lawsuit, the states are claiming that, quote, subsidized health insurance through the ACA is a valuable public benefit that encourages unlawfully present, unlawfully present alien beneficiaries to remain in the United States, end quote. And it's like, OK, we talked about this last week. I mean, I'm sorry, yesterday, whatever, fucking Wednesday. They already get debit cards loaded with enough cash to like buy filet mignon and caviar at the grocery store. So why, you know, why not give them free health care? Right. And meanwhile, I have to decide if I want glasses or contacts when I go to the eye doctor, because the insurance that I actually pay for 
doesn't cover both. But let's just give free health care to migrants. <laughs> right. I have the most expensive health insurance um, option. And when my son got stitches, we still owed $1,500 for three right. stitches. And we have insurance. And But these people, yeah, go ahead. You get free everything. It is unreal. You know what? I'm glad there's lawsuits, though, because I feel like I'm so sick of congressional hearings that go nowhere. Yes. But if there are lawsuits and it's going to federal court, then that gives me at least a little bit of hope that maybe something will actually be done. I, I guess it remains to be seen. But speaking of things getting done before we go, it is now, what, 19 days since Kamala became the unelected Democrat candidate. And I'm going to keep calling her that because she was the fucking unelected candidate <laughs> and still no press conference. Right. But apparently she finally told reporters yesterday that she's going to give a press conference. And here's what she said. Quote, I've talked to my team. I want us to get an interview scheduled before the end of the month. End quote. Like the end of the you, month? The end of the month. Yeah. I'm so fucking busy. We're going to try to talk to the media by the end of the month. Okay. And first of all, like, do you believe that this is actually going to be an unscripted interview? Because I don't. No. No, it'll be they'll be given the questions. It'll be probably with like CNN or MSNBC. It's so like, think about this for a second. OK, when you're running as a candidate, you want to be in front of the cameras as much as possible. She doesn't, which tells me like they don't need that. They know they can do this basement strategy just like they did right. with Biden and that she'll somehow win anyways. But you want to know why you want to know why she's going to do a press conference all of a sudden? Because last night, Trump did a press conference. He did like a two-hour press conference where he went over every major issue that Americans are worried about. He's talking about the economy and a threat of a depression. He's talking about how we're on the verge of World War III. And he's giving actual solutions and policies of how he will interact. And he he called out Kamala. I didn't watch the whole thing. I've just seen clips. We could probably do a whole episode on it. But he called out Kamala and saying how she has not had a press conference, how she was trolling him for two weeks on social media about the debate. And then she decides to back out of the debate. So he went ahead and scheduled three debates with three different networks. And we'll see if she actually shows up to any of those. Um, he showed up to a CNN debate. He went into enemy territory. I highly doubt she's going to do the same and go to a Fox News debate. Like, there's no way. Yeah. Mm -mm. No, it'll be a mainstream socialist fucking news outlet that will control the narrative. Right. But like you said earlier, if they know that they can go on social media and psychologically get people to change their viewpoint, then she doesn't need to talk. She doesn't need to debate. She can just hide right. in the basement and let this you know, manufactured celebrity status run the campaign for her. So it's it's just so unreal. But I got to say, this episode does give me hope. The fact that there are lawsuits, this is federal court, um, I think is a really big deal. And the whole thing with Garm, I mean, there was so much censorship. And the fact that they're immediately shutting down, I mean, it speaks volumes. And I think, I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that we're going to see all these misinformation labels magically disappear in the near future. I will keep my fingers crossed. Yep, me too. All right. Well, at least we have somewhat of good news for you going into the weekend. I hope everyone has a great weekend and we'll be back here on Monday. Thanks for tuning in.